Welcome to the Hyper Guy Motivational Podcast. I have an amazing guest on. He's one of my favorite people in my whole life. He's one of my heroes. Um, so as everybody knows, Steve Maxwell. Thank you so much for being here, Steve. Hey, you're very welcome. Always happy to help you out, and, Mark. And happy Thanksgiving to you. So yeah. uh, there you go. I have to give you the little intro again for some of the people, and I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, uh, so Steve's been on here a couple times already, and He's always a person everybody asked me about. So I said, I've got to ask Steve to come on. And he's so gracious to come on before Thanksgiving. So, so lucky to have, so lucky to have you here, Steve. So Steve is a fitness instructor extraordinaire. He's a BJ, a, B, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu legend or BBA, a BJJ legend. Everybody, every jiu-jitsu person in the whole world knows Steve Maxwell. He's one of the nicest people in the whole world. I made sure I have to add that in the intro because he's just such a person <laughs> He's a man of service, and, and that's one of the reasons I really, really love having him on because he's always uh, uh, giving back to the community, and you just don't find a lot of people that are committed to, to just giving back to the community like Steve. And Steve, can you remind me a little bit about your fitness background? I know we always we talked about it in the other podcast, but if you could just really quickly go over uh, where you went to college and how long you've how long you been in the BJJ and fitness industry. Actually, it started even before college. I, Martin, I knew when I was 12 years old that I wanted to be a fitness instructor. At that time, I admired my coaches and my PE instructors in high school. And I wanted to be a, a gym teacher and a wrestling coach. And uh, I started lifting weights in my father's basement in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, back in 1964. And, you know, the old York barbell programs, you know, and... Uh, you might be too young to remember the old Strength and Health magazines and Bob Hoffman. And <laughs> that's where I cut my teeth. And then uh, in the 70s, when I was an undergrad at Westchester State Teachers College, it wasn't even a university back then, it was a state teachers college. I was majoring in health and PE. And uh, I got into the Nautilus machines and the whole Nautilus circuit training and really fell in love with Arthur Jones. Fast forward, after graduating, I coached wrestling, taught uh, PE in the high school for a while. I, uh, I sagged into the adult fitness industry, and uh, I, I found I liked working with older adults more than the kids, you know, kids are pretty tough. Even back in the 70s, they were pretty tough to deal with, man. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, although I, I did love coaching wrestling. And then uh, I was always looking for that magic something to replace wrestling. I wrestled four years NCAA Division One, And, uh, you know, that was like the highlight of my life. I was always looking for something to replace the thrill I got from all those years of wrestling. And I wrestled like the freestyle circuit for a while, you know, but I had to make my living, you know. You... you um, Wrestling's a young man's game. And then around 89, I discovered the Gracie Brothers. And I had worked as fitness director and uh, at a bunch of different center city uh, gym in Philadelphia. And uh, discovered Gracie Jiu-Jitsu around 89, 88, I guess. And then opened up my own gym, Maxercise, in uh, January of 1990 on a sh shoestring budget and opened up the first BJJ school in the Eastern United States. And I was pr primarily staying with high intensity training model, uh, hammer strength, uh, vintage Nautilus with retrofitted uh, cams. Got very involved with super slow. I thought, because most of my clients were elderly, it was ironic because I created this upstairs jujitsu academy where it's all young bucks. And then downstairs, the average age of my clients were mid 40s, early 50s, uh, even people as old as their 80s coming in. So super slow was a good fit for us. But then we had the young guys upstairs. So it was very interesting. It was uh, a lot of experimentation. Um, there wasn't any real uh, business models for this type of uh, thing back then. Uh, there was no one leading the way. I was the only one on the East Coast. There was no one out. It was just me, me in uh, Torrance, California. Hey, and, let me let me ask you a question, Steve. When you were um, 
you're considered one of the best, the, one of the most amazing BJJ legends around. I mean, everybody, when they bring up your name, they know who you are. What what got you into traveling so much? One of, one of the things I always, one of the visions I have of you is you went on these, like, it's, I don't even know how to say it. You went on these, like, journeys where you just, and I think you talked about this in your other, other podcast, you would put all your stuff in one bag and just, like, travel all over the world and what do you how do you know what to take <laughs> how do you know what to take and were you scared going or were you scared to go all these journeys the reason i did it was divorce <laughs> i uh you know after running my gym and jujitsu school for almost 20 years like the better part of two decades you know everything comes to an end Hey Steve, um, some uh, can you? There might be something with your mic. Do you? Uh, I don't know. There, uh, I can. There's a little bit of clicking there. Is it still going on? Uh, yeah, it might be. The mic needs to be adjusted a little bit, maybe. Okay, I'm just talking through my iPad here. But how about now? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's for some reason it's a little bit better. Maybe you have to talk a little closer to it. Maybe. Yeah, I can sit a little bit closer. Huh. Okay. Uh, anyway. After after the divorce, I sold the gym. I literally gave my jiu-jitsu school to a young Brazilian kid I had brought up from uh, Brazil as his favorite, who runs Gracie San Diego, by the way, a fantastic guy. And uh, I went out to Arizona to work with a pro baseball player. He used to be a, a Philadelphia Philly. And I was working with him as his private coach, uh, conditioning coach. When that contract was up, I, I moved into a camper van and just kind of drove around for three years, living out of my van like a kid. Really loved it, you know? And it was fun. I always liked that uh, kind of nomadic thing. Always had this dream of ri driving an RV around. I was in my 50s. And then I uh, started getting invitations all over the world, you know? Germany, Europe, you know, uh, UK. And what do you do with a camper van when you're traveling. I mean, you know, I've got a store somewhere, right? So I decided to sell it and cut all ties. That meant uh, weaving everything down into basically one bag travel. But my first time abroad, I had this huge 65 liter bag and I quickly realized, oh my God, I'm dragging too much crap around. You know, it only took three train uh, changes in London, up and down stairs, and trying to hustle to make a train to realize, man, I need something really light. So I figured, you know, you just don't need that much stuff. And I became a true minimalist. I literally lived out of one bag to fit in my back, and I had like a little smaller carry on, like a little man purse thing, you know, with my papers and, you know, cash and, you know, stuff like that. And I lived that way for damn close to 14 years. How, I didn't how, live in any one place. I just moved. How, so how many countries did you go to, Steve? And, and at least how, about 44, I think. A lot. And, and then like, would, they, would they just kind of build on each other? Like people would hear yeah, about. Yeah, so yeah. Would they, would, we would link the, uh, the trips together. So would they, so would they, would, would they want, was it like a combination of, were they like fitness instructor, half of it, and then BJJ, or how did yeah, how did it, that it work? Was like a little compilation of everything. Some some BJJ, some fitness. You know, I'm into a lot of stuff, and you know, I, I I've been teaching and doing breath work for a long time, which is pretty popular right now. Back then, not so much. Uh, I, I've been into minimalist training uh, for a long time. So I mean, there was a lot of things that I was doing that people were interested in learning. Uh, I've been interested in holistic health, and uh, I've, I've gotten more into uh, the more esoteric health practices, you know, a little Qigong. Uh, uh, the breath work is somewhat esoteric for some people. Uh, different forms of meditation, uh, breathing, energy work, things like this. And people found it fascinating. They wanted to learn more. And I would go to where they're at that host me. I'd stay at an Airbnb or a hotel. You know, you can imagine my expenses were <laughs> pretty, pretty good. And uh, I, I, I kept that up for a long time. And usually, 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Mark, after spending a winter in Scandinavia, I said, okay, every winter we're going south where it's warm. I started going to Australia during the uh, northern winter. I go down southern hemisphere. Uh, I started doing that every year. So usually I would end up wintering in Australia. But how, in the beginning, how, uh, man, it was damn cold because, you know, when you're living out of one backpack, it's hard to have summer clothes and winter clothes. You know? so, so what did you take? Did you ever get in a situation where you're like, I don't have clothes. I'm supposed to dress up and go to this event or I'm supposed to like go to this thing and I have to wear nice clothes, but I only bought these travel clothes. What did you do? Well, I said to myself a long time ago, any place where I have to wear a coat and tie or a suit, I don't want to have anything to do with it, man. Nothing. I don't go to birthday parties. I don't go to bar mitzvahs. I don't go to funerals. I don't go to weddings. I don't care about that stuff, you know? Any place where I have to dress up, that's not a place for me. You know, I'm just myself. I wear clean, nice clothes, but uh, nothing fancy, you know? And what, what was your what's your favorite thing about Australia? You travel to all these places in the world and... Um... I, I I just like the Aussies. I, I, I like the people in Australia. I just thought they were very warm and friendly and damn funny. Very quirky sense of humor. And I love the um, Australian slang. I, I, they had the funniest words for things. I just thought it was hilarious. Very, uh, very witty, you know? And let me ask you this. Um... But that wasn't my favorite country. So yeah, I, I think you. Yeah, I want to hear what your what's your what was your favorite country? I think Austria, Austria and uh, Bavaria and Germany. Oh my God, so beautiful! Really like it there, man. Really, so, really. What do you, what do you like about those places? I like mountains and lakes and you know picturesque. You know the Alps. I mean, God, you can't go wrong with it. What about the best food? What's the best food you've had? Well, I mean, I've got good food everywhere. In Europe, it's actually easier to get good food than even in America. They, you know, they, they don't do the GMOs and they don't, uh, you know, they, they, they rejected a lot of the uh, big, big uh, agriculture movements, you know. Uh, you can still get, like, really good farmer's market stuff. You know, you have to be selective. I, I have a very simple diet, nothing fancy, you know. I'm, I, I'm glad you brought this up and I wanted to ask you, there's like, it's like, I have a million questions for you that I wanted to ask you on the other ones. Um, what do you find are the, are the most common injuries that, that people have when they engage in jujitsu or in other sports and that you have to overcome the, I mean, you have to over, over the, overcome those kind of injuries. What are the most typical kind of injuries that people are dealing with? Well, you know, obviously, jujitsu. For those people that don't know, it's like a form of grappling or wrestling, and um, you know, you're basically you win by submitting a person. What does that mean? You cause them pain by twisting or bending their joints until they either tap out, which means submission, or they cry out in pain, or you can choke them unconscious. <laughs> That's a rough sport, but ironically. I had fewer injuries doing jujitsu than I did doing regular folk style and freestyle wrestling. That being said, I would say the most common injuries are spine, neck, a lot of knee, ankle, shoulder, pretty much the primary joints, a lot of elbow stuff, fingers. People's fingers get really arthritic from over gripping the gi and having the gi pulled out. You'll find that common to sports like judo and Jiu-Jitsu, and there's a hybrid, Sambo, which is a combat, it's a Russian sport. It's a combination of Judo wrestling. You see a lot of finger, wrist stuff, mostly joints. A lot of the guys have inflammatory diet. They don't, you know. So what like, is... They're pounding protein, this misguided idea that they need to eat all this protein, and it causes a lot of gut inflammation, hmm. especially if they're taking these protein powders and all that stuff. So uh, pretty toxic, really. So what, so have you had any injuries, Steve, at all that you've had to overcome? And what did you, what were those injuries and how'd you do it? Oh, I had a lot of injuries. I started in wrestling, you know, I separated my shoulder, but probably at least three times. That's very painful. I mean, you can't even pee without, you know, your shoulder being involved somehow. 
The rib injuries were terrible. I literally tore a uh, one of my ribs off the cartilage in the bottom. I mean, it literally just came off the cartilage. That took me about three months. Rib injuries take forever to heal. Very irritating. That's another thing where you can't even sit up in bed or turn over, or even you know do anything without the with, with without the rib bugging you. And uh, you know, I had a bad spine injury at one point. Uh, I had L4 rotation, subluxation. I've had a couple of neck injuries and so forth. Uh, I broke a toe one time where the bone came out through the skin. The cap of the toe tore clean off the bone. But luckily, I didn't need surgery. They just put the toe back on the bone and popped it. You know. And so no, arth- no arthritis because most of my jiu-jitsu friends have some kind of arthritis from doing jiu-jitsu for so long. Um, uh, a little bit. A little bit. You know, definitely my right shoulder. I had multiple injuries through college, high school, college. And I did, I used to train really stupid. I did a lot of momentum based lifts, power cleans, kettlebell snatches. That, that's not good. You know, anytime you're heaving, swinging, using momentum, throwing weights around, you put tremendous stress in all your joints. And it exacerbates anything that you're doing with martial arts or combat. So I've stopped, oh, probably. Quite a while ago, all momentum based lifts. No heaving, swinging, yanking, throwing, nothing. You know, all so, controlled. Controlled so, reps. So are you even doing, uh, are you still doing deadlifts? Yeah. yeah but yeah. you do them very sl- slow. Slowly. And I'm not worried about the weight. The only people that should be worried about the amount of weight are weight lifters. You know, your ability to lift a heavy weight is not indicative of actually how strong you are necessarily. I mean, obviously, if a guy can deadlift a 1,000 pounds, he's damn strong, no doubt about it. But, you know, there's a skill to lifting heavy weight. And I've, you know, he knows, I mean, I've gone up against guys in jiu-jitsu that don't lift weights at all, and oh, my God, they feel like beasts. So, you know, there is general strength, and then there's the specific skill of lifting heavy weights. And as you get older, you do not need to be lifting heavy weights at all. So you can use lighter weights with high tension repetition, not using momentum, being careful, uh, what we call turnarounds, like being able to change direction slowly and smoothly and give yourself, really kick your own ass with a great workout with no injury. And since I've been training that way, actually my shoulder feels pretty good. I mean, wow. I, there's still things I'm limited in, but for the most part, I can do just about everything I want to do. I, I know that's why that's why it's so amazing. I I, I said this before, before you got on the podcast. You look like you're in your 30s because <laughs> because you take care of yourself so well. And you said, "No, I'm 70." I'm like, "No, no way. It doesn't even feel real." Well, here's the thing. A lot of people they think training is the, the what they need to do. More and more training. No. Rest. All the magic happens during rest. Training is a stress, is a stimulus, and you got to wait for your body to recover. And then you got to wait longer because let's say you're point zero. You train, you go down to a minus one within a certain number of hours or even days, depending how hard you train, you come back to point zero. You're recovered. That's when most guys train again. So they keep bouncing up and down. They never give themselves the extra rest time to go to plus one. That's where adaptation So, so, so Stephen, if, if you can explain that, what does that mean? So I know most of my friends, they, most of them work out and do some cardio or do some exercise or lift every day. What do you recommend? That you take a day off or you change a body part? Or what do you recommend in terms I of rest? Once, I lift once a week. That's enough. Believe me, my workout is freaking hard, man. It only takes about 20 minutes, and it is an ass kicker. And, and then, and do you, do you, of course, I do something every day. Yeah, so, I mean, do you do, you do other do things? Breath work. I'm still teaching four times a week, uh, teaching BJJ, and I, I roll with my students on two of those days. I used to roll more, but, you know, more isn't necessarily better to get over. And the, the, the key to, you know, aging well, especially with the sport, Get your rest. 
I go to bed between 8.30 and 9, old grandpa here, and I, I get a lot of sleep. I think it's really important. Most people are sleep deprived. You cannot build muscle and you cannot lose body fat effectively at all if you are sleep deprived. And so how many, how get, many, uh, how many hours do you recommend? Uh, eight, most to, my, eight to ten. Eight, okay, eight yeah. to ten. Yeah, I mean, if you really want to adapt and you know get high level of fitness. Now, okay. Well, then the other thing is vitamin D. You gotta make sure your vitamin D levels are up good. You know, you, um, you can get that through sunlight, but I live in the Pacific Northwest now, so not so easy. So, you know, supplementary D, pretty important. And just eating a really good diet. That means staying away from the gluten, staying away from the nightshades, you know, like the tomatoes and the, the potatoes and the, the you know, the, the, uh, oh, oh, the um, uh, green peppers and all those nightshades, eggplant, all that crap. And uh, staying away from, did I say gluten? The um, grain type products for the most part. And what, what what kind of, vi do you take vitamins or do you do you recommend people take vitamins? And then what yeah. about people, what about yeah. people don't? I mean, for a while I was anti-vitamin, you know, because listen, if you're taking vitamins willy nilly, you may be doing more harm than good. You may be creating a big imbalance in your body because you don't know. You may have all sorts of mineral imbalances, and minerals are way more important than vitamins. You know, all all of your metabolic processes and you know your glands depend on a mineral to operate. So, uh, I got a hair mineral analysis, not. There's only one lab that does it right in the U.S., as far as I know. Uh, most of the labs will wash the hair before doing the mineral analysis, which ruins the test. So this lab does not wash the hair. They analyze your hair. You can see what toxic minerals you have in your body, you know, toxic metals. I had elevated mercury. Uh, I was eating seafood. Uh, I don't recommend seafood other than sardines because there's so much mercury in all seafood. Unfortunately, our food supply has been ruined. And uh, uh, I, you know, I found, I found some uh, uh, copper, uh, zinc imbalance. I had elevated mercury and uh, cadmium and aluminum. So I was given supplements. I went to this guy, real uh, biochemist, nutritionist, who analyzed my hair mineral analysis, and he prescribed for me what I needed to bring me back into balance. And once I get balance, I won't need all those supplements anymore, for the most part. You know, of course, once again, our our food supply has, you know, been demineralized through improper farming and you know, so how did... herbicides, you know, so... depleted soils, uh, using too much chemical, artificial chemicals in the soil, it's altered our food supply. It's not, an apple is not the same thing. Uh, today is not what our grandfathers ate, whole different. So you know. Steve, is, is, it, is, it, is it like, in your own analysis though, it's, it's significantly different in terms of our food supply, in terms of nutrition and stuff you get out of it. You're not getting everything that you really, probably in books or wherever you're reading that what like, you know, but how do you know what to take without messing yourself up even more or the hair mineral analysis and uh, a blood test tell a little bit, but you know, you could have a blood test in the morning and then go back later that day and get a completely different result. So blood tests are not particularly uh, useful and stuff like this, but hair mineral analysis doesn't, but you need a guy that knows how to read them for one thing. And you got to send the hair to the right lab, you know, I work with this guy, Vince Polito, really good guy, man. He hooked me up. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm a layman, but I've been around for a long time, man. And I've hey, seen, can... you know, I've oh. had some really good mentor, people that really do know. And basically, I know the people to go to for the stuff I don't know. And let me ask you this. Uh, can you talk about this, the breath work that you do? Yeah, and can you tell me, you know, why you started and what are the benefits? Mostly through uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu. 
I, I, I had extensive contact with the Gracies through the late 80s, 90s, into the 2000s. And uh, Master Hickson was one of the uh, primary breathologists, but all his brothers knew. They all had a peculiar way of breathing, which I thought was very interesting. And at the time, he wasn't really teaching it, but now he does. And I, I'm teaching a lot of the things that he showed me. And then later, I got very interested in some other types of martial arts when I was traveling. Uh, I know it's not real popular to talk about Russia right now, but um, I like Russian people. I've been to Russia eight times. Uh, they're wonderful people. Don't go by governments and judge a, a, a people. There's wonderful, wonderful people in Russia. I'd love to see all this crap go in. I've been to the Ukraine. Wonderful people. One of my martial arts instructors was Ukrainian. Really good guy. And I learned this Slavic, this Russian Slavic health system when there from masters. And uh, it's called Sistema. Maybe you've heard of it, the system. Uh, some people are familiar with the uh, Sistema in Toronto from uh, Vladimir Vasiliev. And probably some people have seen on YouTube the, 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 the big heavy guy, uh, Ryabko. Uh, but there's other systems. And one guy was Alexei Alexevich Kadesnikov down in Krasnodar, in the south of Russia. He was the father of Russian military martial arts. This is serious shit. Anyone that thinks it's bullshit, just go down there. Test it. That's you know, amazing. Go with my jiu-jitsu background, dude. So, so I won't want to mess with this guy. So, my point is, they taught breathing as it relates to relaxation, power, getting rid of all the tension in your body. Because if you're really tense, you basically telegraph all your intentions and any kind of fighting. So the idea is to get rid of the tension, which conserves your energy and keeps you from being tired. Because if you're really tense, you know, you get tired really quick. So between what I learned from the Gracie brothers, and what I learned from the Sistema masters, uh, I was able to piece together some really good health practices. Because ironically, even though it's for fighting, it's the healthiest thing that you can do for your general health. Most people do not get enough oxygen. O2. They overbreathe, they breathe shallow, they breathe in their upper chest, and they're oxygen deprived. And you have to learn how to breathe and use the lung apparatus in the proper way. And there's different breaths for different activities, different ways to breathe. I don't breathe uh, walking like I do for running. I don't breathe for strength training like I do for running. I breathe when I'm sparring in, in BJJ different than I strength train. So different, different uh, techniques of using the breath. Hey, hey, Steve, what, what advice would you give to someone if they said, I don't have time to exercise? Uh, what, and they said, I only have, I have 10 minutes a day. Um, what is your response usually to them? And you what, rec I mean, what recommendations? What recommendations? I could kick someone's ass in 10 minutes with a really good routine. <laughs> you know? I, I would say for people really, really, really tied up with family and career, first of all, you got to, figure out what your priorities are. You know, a lot of people will prioritize making money and careers and family. I understand the family part, for sure. But, you know, there's been many a millionaire, multimillionaire on their deathbed that would have prayed for a few more years to do what they want to do. Uh, Steve Jobs, for example, man, what a sad story. I don't know whether you ever read his, you know, his deathbed statement it was the saddest thing in the world he would have given up all those millions or billions or whatever he had just you know to have a few more years just saying prior priority but i would say do the five rights to tibet and yoga i mean i'll be more it takes about five six minutes you know it's good look it up online look up uh, the eye of the revelation it's a little book you can buy on amazon it describes 
how to do the five rites of Tibetan yoga. I think it's a really good uh, system. Buy one of my joint mobility tapes on uh, stevemashallsc.com. I have tons of, you know, I have this one series called Give Me Five Mobility. Five minutes. You can do a different five-minute segment each that, uh, each time. Yeah, you know, I, Steve, I you, want... And you can do a little energy I, I, uh, exercise I, snacks during the day. Hey, like, you know, Steve... Steve, I wanted you if you can talk. You have some amazing, and I, you know, you have some amazing workouts on your site. I, what I love is the variety of them. Can you talk about some of the, the? You have such a wide variety of different ways to exercise, very innovative ideas and p things that people just would never think about. So, can you talk about some of those, um, some of the the, the, the instructional videos? Yeah. I've changed over the years, you know, obviously as a man in ages, you know, you got to change the way you approach things, what you do. Uh, I, I definitely am not in the kettlebells anymore, and I, I don't really recommend them at all. Uh, there was a time I was like the kettlebell king, but I realized it's unsustainable, and I, I, I think ultimately it really uh, uh, places too much wear and tear on the joint. It erodes joint health over time. You might not get an acute injury during the actual workout, but you get these subacute injuries that build up over the, the days, weeks, months, years. And you can end up with a pretty good case of arthritis if you're not careful. Uh, so I'm very much into isometrics and body weight training these days. But I do have some really, really good uh, videos on isometrics. Uh, but, uh, I have probably one of the best body weight courses ever for anyone. Uh, I, I, I put a lot of time and effort into it. Uh, body weight course where I basically teach you how to teach other people. I mean, you can teach your mother how to do a push up. That would not be easy. Imagine teaching an 80 year old how to do a push up. How would you do it? Well, I know how, and I show you how on that body weight course. And yeah, I, I, I love all your, yeah. I mean, when I, when I looked at your site, you know, look at your site, even just, you know, over a year ago, I, I I've been looking at your site for a, a much longer than that. Um, I, I honestly never thought I'd have the, the, the amazing opportunity to, in, to interview you. So I, I, I'm very, very fortunate I get to do that all the time. And one of, one of the things yeah, I, I, just, I just started a new thing where uh, I was a little reluctant in the beginning. But for a nominal fee, you can join my site and get access to every single video on there. Plus, I do monthly updates and continuous videos about what I'm up to, what I'm into, what I do. I write uh, a blog article. I'm always uploading new videos. And for uh, 400 bucks a year, you can get access to every single thing on there. And Steve, let me ask you this. How do you balance your life so well? You, you have a... Um... You have an extremely busy schedule. You're, you know, to be honest with you, I don't even know how you, you're able to get on to so many shows and podcasts that you have over the years. Um, how do you have such a balanced lifestyle? I know you just you had a camp recently. You're extremely busy. Well, you know, I was really busy when I was traveling. I mean, that was it got pretty exhausted uh, towards the end. Of, I mean, I got really tired. I started getting a little burned out. And during, just before the pandemic, uh, I pulled off the uh, road. I was actually warned. This may sound unusual, maybe strange. Uh, I had a astrologer that warned me almost a year in advance to get off the road before 2020. That in early 2020, there was going to be some type of worldwide disaster. And he kept using, he didn't know what it was. You know, he wasn't, he couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was. They said it was going to be really big and it was going to, uh, he kept using the word martial, like martial law, which is basically what those damn mandates were, you know, unconstitutional mandates, martial law. Yeah. Hey, Steve, let me ask you a question. And, uh, anyway, I pulled off the road and I set myself up for an online business. I do online personal training. Uh, in-person Zoom sessions like we're doing now. It's amazing how much you can accomplish even online. So I was able to keep, you know, like a lot of people I met in Europe, they would sign up for weekly workouts. Some people want to just do a monthly thing where they work out on their own. And then once a month, I meet with them online, we discuss the programs, 
and their diet. And then they send me email logs on both diet and their workout progress. And some people just work out with me live once or twice a week. And I, I set that business up. So I was able to engineer my life so that I can prioritize, prioritize you know, self-cultivation. So I, I block off my schedule so that I can do my health practices. Hey, Steve, what's the difference that you've noticed? Because you've trained professional athletes and and just your, our novice athletes. What is the difference in terms of their training and drive to succeed, I guess? Or is there a difference? Not always. I mean, obviously, the professional, his livelihood depends on it. So he's a little bit you know, more motivated. But you know what I find, Martin? Um, discipline trumps motivation. You know, being motivated is fleeting. It's a feeling. You know how feelings come and go. Feelings are based on moods. You know, moods could be anything from your tummy kind of hurts and you're in a bad mood to whatever, you know. So motivation, you can't depend on it. You can't. But discipline, establishing habits and sticking with them. I'm not talking about putting yourself in a rut, you know but establishing good positive habits and being very disciplined to follow through. Things that you know are good for you, things that you know you should do, and you do them because you should, not because you necessarily enjoy them all the time. So that's a big one. And as far as working out high-level athletes, basically anyone can work with a high-level athlete. They, they're genetically superior people. You know, you have this big bell curve with the far end, you know, really low. And then in the middle, you, you have most of us. And then on the other end, you have like a very small percentage of people with the genetics to be elite athletes or bodybuilders or fitness models. And then most of us are somewhere in between. So and can you can you tell the difference? The same end where people are like genetic superiors. They would grow and get strong and muscular and be better, even if they didn't train at all, than most people. It's so true. you can so you can tell, Steve, can you tell, like you're saying, like they're genetically these professional athletes, can you tell the difference? Like is, I mean, there must be a, is there a significant difference that you could, that you've noticed? Like, like it, ability, their ability to recover from hard work. Now, I'm not saying that they're great because only because of their genetics, because they're going up against other genetic wonders. So yes, these guys work very, very hard at their trade and their sport and what they do. They really put the time in. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is many times they can get away with things that you and I could not get away with. Things that would either hurt us or train at a, a, a level and a volume that would just make us exhausted, adrenal burnout. And for the average guy, and most of us are average, or a little above average, maybe a little below average, uh, we should probably do the exact opposite of what most, most high-level athletes do. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, most people, first of all, very few people work out. I don't know whether you have ever seen the industry statistic it's estimated that less than 20 percent of the u.s population actually does any exercise at all i'm talking about you know things like walking the dog and going out every day and then of that about 11 percent probably are strength training it's pretty small although it seems like there's millions and millions uh, it's only because they all congregate in the same places gym and of that group of that 11 percent maybe one-tenth of one percent are elite hmm. elite let me ask you let, see, let me small, ask, small little group so, let, you know. let me ask you what in your view what made what made and it's going to lead into another question what made hicks and gracie so much better than the other gracies when you when you and we're talking about i mean we know he's a bjj legend when you talk about was there anything that you saw in Hickson or Hoist or any of them that you that just could have really stood out for you? Well, for one thing, you, you ever notice his physique was different than the other boys. He was more muscular and stronger. 
And if you have two people of equal skill, the stronger, better conditioned guy is always going to be better. And he, you know, he 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 was just a, a, a genetic phenom, a real wonder, you know, really uh, amazing. And uh, he was not the best teacher. I think his the best teacher was his brother Orleon, the eldest son. But Orleon was not particularly a uh, a good athlete, but an amazing teacher, great practitioner of jujitsu. His kid, his kids are amazing too. His all the, the kids. Henry Hiron, amazing. Amazing. And let me ask you this. There's always, I think we talked about on this a little bit before, but there's like the trend between uh, jujitsu and teaching jujitsu in terms of self-defense versus, um, I'd say, tournament BJJ. Do you still do you still teach the self-defense part of it? And do, That's all do I you... want to teach. You know, everything's geared towards defending yourself. Now, I do teach some technical, what they call technical jujitsu, you know, jujitsu versus jujitsu. But everyone gets a, everyone, every student gets a really solid foundation in basic stand up self defense because every fight starts standing up. You know, there's a, there was a mem out, you know, I specialize in ground fighting, but I can't take it to the ground. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah I don't I don't yeah, yeah, that's that, called it, wrestler. I find that horrible. Yeah, I mean I yeah it's just I that's what it, it, it frustrates me because I started out doing stand up Japanese jiu jitsu before I started doing Brazilian jiu jitsu and it was and I and I had some really friends that were high level jiu jitsu uh, judo practitioners and they became um, they moved over to jiu jitsu but one of the things they'd always say is when I, when they when they first went to Brazilian jiu jitsu is like you know. Um, Fig, I just start off by a hip throw. I'll just hip throw him. And, and, and you know what? And it knocked the wind out of him and the fight's over. And and I just say to myself, it, it just, like you said, you can't start off on your knees giving yourself a fist, a, a fist bump and then go into, that's just not going to happen on the street. So Now, I, th that, that being said, that is a fun little game that you can play. And you can do it well into advanced age. I play that game and I enjoy it. And I realize what it is. And it's certainly not realistic for other than matching your BJJ skills against someone else on the ground. But everyone should learn how to, you know, defend against a punch, a kick, headbutt, any kind of grab, you know, uh, you know, bear hugs, uh, you know, getting pulled or choked from behind, someone grabbing your jacket. But, you know, here's something interesting. Why do guys take boxing or kickboxing uh, thinking that, they need that for self-defense. No, you don't. I'm seven years old. Who, who am I going to be punching out and up? First of all, if I even get into a confrontation, I already screwed up on so many levels. I missed all the signals building up to that. My awareness was gone, man. But like Jocko Wilnick says, and I agree with him 100%, you don't need to be a kickboxer or a karate man or a Muay Thai guy to defend against a guy trying to punch you. All you need is distance. Keep in distance, running away. And if the guy comes to you, it's very easy to close the gap and clinch. And that's where our game starts. The moment I put my hands or you grab me, I'm very comfortable there. And I'm comfortable standing on the ground on top, on the ground on the bottom. When I want to be on an asphalt parking lot, on the ground? No, I avoid it at all costs. But I could, you know. I wear those tough outdoor pants, you know. So, be when I get so, so what do you, what do you tell parents? I'm sure you've had this situation. What do you tell parents when they say, you know, um, you know, I want my my son to be like the number one tournament jujitsu guy. I mean, or or woman. What do you say to them? Well, I say first, it got to be fun. You know, the kid got to be having a good time. If you put emphasis on winning, you know, m most kids, they, they don't quit. They, they don't quit because they, uh, they're they bored with the sport or anything. They quit because they get beat out. They expect that they have to win all the time. And no one wins all the time. And so many of these parents are living vicariously through the kids, you know, like the Little League syndrome, you know. 
putting all this pressure. Let the kids just play and have fun with it. You know, when they get old enough, they'll decide for themselves where they want to take it. The other thing, you know, I hear parents say, well, I'm going to enroll my kid in karate so he can defend himself against bullies. Man, that's a good way to get your kid kicked out of school. You know, with all these all, all these uh, politically correct uh, school programs now uh, where the kids are confused about their gender and, <laughs> and all the crazy stuff, man. They don't even know what sex they are anymore. They, they, uh, they, uh, if you punch Johnny in the nose in school, you're getting thrown out, man. You are. But with jujitsu, you can basically squeeze a guy a little bit, you know, defend yourself. No one's getting a bloody nose. No one's getting chipped tooth. You know, you can pretty much control yourself. And the, 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 uh, the Gracie, program called bully proof for children best ever and you don't use the violence of kicking and punching i mean those things can't be taught there is a time and place maybe for that but certainly you know a lot of stuff goes on in school that the teachers don't catch a lot of stuff behind the scenes and the teachers aren't aware of it on the playground in the bathrooms you know it's not always 100% supervision. And, you know, you want your daughter and your son to know how to handle themselves, but not necessarily with the violence of uh, busting someone in the nose. Hey, what what is your teaching style, Steve? I mean, do you teach differently with kids versus adults? Yeah, with kids, it's all play. you got to disguise everything as play, depending on how young you are, you know. From, you know, like, Usually by the time they can go to school, you know, like first grade up, they can start learning BJJ. You teach one or two basic skills. And then you have a catch. Well, if you train this skill and you show me you can do it, well, then we're going to play a game. And the game is the hook because they love to play games at that age. And the game is always martial related in some way. I used to have like 20 different games that rotate, all geared towards developing attributes for martial arts, but fun little games, really fun. Competitive, you know. And what about, I I, I always believe that, you know, there's no such thing as participation trophies or participation ribbons. No, 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 no. There's winners and there's losers. It's okay to lose. It, It is, but, Okay, the winner gets the trophy. And, and and what do you do like do because like I said, you teach adults and and um, kid, children as well. Do you still speak about like you know the old the old you know jujitsu plays? They say, they give you life lessons too. Do you have those discussions with kids about hey, this is what's well? I don't know. really have that much contact with children anymore, but I do have a lot of young adults. You know, twenty somethings. I mean, it's still like a kid. <laughs> Still like a child to me. I mean, wow. When I was in my twenties, I, I didn't know much. You know, <laughs> thought I knew everything. I realized I didn't know anything. Yeah, you know, it's funny. You know, Martin. As you get older, you realize you know less and less. I mean, every day I wake up and thinking, man, I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You think about I... a lot of stuff that you know. There's a lot of things that like, wow, I really don't know. And and how did how did your how did Zach how did you get him involved in the sport? Well, it was kind of a sad story there in a way, you know. He was kind of pushed into it, you know, and it was almost like he didn't have a choice. Sort of like the Gracies in a way, you know. He started doing it when he was basically a fetus, <laughs> and from the moment he was born, I was wrestling with him and playing with him and handing him upside down and doing all crazy fitness stuff and. You know, he could climb a rope upside down when he was in kindergarten. Try wow. to climb a rope upside down <laughs> burden with no legs. That is a one strong little monkey. He was a, like a little monkey. Unbelievably strong. And um, I pushed him too much, you know. He kind of burned out. And it, it's a shame. I, I kind of blame myself for that. I, I was a little overzealous with him, you know. I put a little bit too more, more pressure than, than uh, I, I should have. But, you know, he was a phenom. I mean, and, really- and, and in retrospect, when you think back on that, I'm sure it sounds like you have some regrets about it. But 
did he I, did, did he come back did he say to you hey dad i wish in retrospect i wish that you didn't push me so hard or 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 did he just say you know what? discussion he, he felt like you know he didn't really have a choice yeah the choice uh the choice of no choice and uh you know, he, he felt like he just had kind of do there was a lot of pressure on him. And he was damn good. I mean, he won worlds, you know. I mean, but uh, he's very happy doing what he does. He doesn't really, um, he trains you just now and again. But for the most part, he's an artist. And he's, he's uh, he loves being by himself and doing his artwork. And he's very happy doing that. And he's really good at it, too. He's he felt a really he's, good. He, he he probably could never keep up with you because you were always traveling. I, like every time he probably turned around, he probably like, "Where's Waldo? Where's my dad?" <laughs> I so. called him a lot. You know, we we touch base. You know, I haven't called him for well two weeks is a long time, but usually once a week we touch base. You know, and my daughter Savannah, uh, she could have been a hell of a jujitsu girl, but see, I pushed her too early too. I got her into a tournament, and uh, it was really unfair. It, it was uh, uh sorry stupid text coming through uh, i put she got hurt uh it was like a naga tournament which was shittily organized i hate naga i don't like anything about the way they organize the tournaments they were allowing the kids to do things like neck cranks and a little peewee wrestler you know i mean like wrestling is gives a young kid a huge leg up over like just a novice jiu-jitsu player and they're mixing the boys and the girls and i realize at that age there's not a whole lot of difference physiologically but she got her neck cranked and she cried and she never wanted to do it again and man i rude the day that i got her into that tournament i really truly did so it's a, it's a, it goes back to what you said before like steve you just want to make sure they have fun and in retrospect all the experience you have now you learned you know what the, it's the main thing is that they enjoy it and have fun so that they i think hickson talks about that a lot too about making sure they have fun make it again doing. make it again don't push uh learn from my mistakes but uh savannah has a happy ending though. she uh she is into I, i'm not really into this i, I don't necessarily avoid, advise people going into it but she's like an amazing crossfit athlete she is a beast She's also a power lifter, won Pennsylvania State Championship in power lifting. She's lifting more as a as body weight at 128 than most men twice her size. I swear to God, she's incredibly strong. And uh, she uh, also does uh, strong women uh, events, like strong men contests or whatever, you know. And um, I see her videotape. She is really powerful, man. Okay, so I, I know you only have a, I know you only have a few minutes left. So I have some really quick questions for you here. Um, what is the, what have you eaten in another country that was extremely strange when you think back on it? Uh, probably shark fin in Iceland. Oh man, couldn't couldn't get past the smell. It was like, a, kind of like a fermented rotted shark fin, which is considered a delicacy. Don't get past it. However, I love the sheep's head. They serve the sheep head. So, you know, you're eating like all the flesh behind the nose and the eyeballs and all that. Man, oh, that was, wow. That was definitely <laughs> delicious. But the hey. shark, it smelled like, uh, to me, it smelled like uh, vomit. I oh, think. my God. The sheep's head. I wasn't, expect, I wasn't expecting that one, Steve. I've never heard of that one. Oh, um, and Mickey whale. They eat whale. Man, those whales. Whales are delicious. <laughs> What okay? What is the what? I feel what like, uh, the uh, the eco people will be horrified, but they've been well <laughs> since two thousand years. Man. What what is the one thing you have? What is the one thing you must take with you on every trip that you go? Well, because I was making my living online, I obviously needed my uh, iPad and my iPhone. Always, I had, you know, I, I could get by with just the clothes on my back. As long as I, I could get to my bank account and make a living, you know, as long as I was connected, I was good. I was basically a, a what they call a digital nomad without knowing it, but that's what I was. What's your, what's your favorite dessert? I don't eat dessert. I deserted the desserts probably 40 years ago. 
Okay, so uh, so what's your favorite, like your favorite uh, guilty pleasure food? I don't feel guilt about food because I eat good. Yeah, so what, tell me what you. So what's your what's your favorite, like your favorite food? Um, I love lamb. I love lamb too. Yeah, turkey. I love sardines. You know, I love cooked vegetables. Um, I I I will eat. Um, Blue corn chips. Oh, corn yeah. Chips very, very good. But, you know, you have to blow them out carefully. Can't eat too many. It's actually on my diet. They're the highest natural source of selenium. Even though they do have some vegetable oil in it, the way they cook, cook the blue corn, it seals the selenium. So if you eat just a few, you know, no more and then, than 10, what is, Okay, so what is, what do you do, Steve? And this is a, this is a really good question for someone like you. Um, what do you do to relax or have fun? Meditation, breath work. I do this thing called pulling down where I pull the energy through the fine energy channels of my body. And I do it while walking, uh, standing, uh, sometimes doing what they call systemic jogging or running where you're just kind of bouncing and shaking and breathing down. Very relaxing. Oh, man, it feels incredible you just feel so good like you got a massage your muscles feel very relaxed and uh i listen to uh brain entrainment uh with the over the ear earphones um uh, uh either theta brainwave meditations or uh, i've been doing a uh, delta brainwave meditation and some of them are guided with guided imagery and some have subliminal cuts where you can't hear the words or the affirmation. And it, it's a way of programming the subconscious mind. So I do that to relax. And I usually have a nap every day, you know, after lunch. Sometimes I'll listen to those, uh, the uh, brain training uh, tapes. And, and you do, uh, and, and of course, you do a lot of like wonderful podcasts for people. So <laughs> I'm appreciative of that too. Well, let me ask you this. How would somebody get a hold of you um, if they want to get a hold of you? And if you, uh, do you have any camps or anything coming up? Um, what's your schedule? Like? I'm planning in Greece again. Uh, I did um, for years. I had always go to this island, Ikaria. It's one of the blue zones. For those that don't know, blue zones are where an inordinate amount of people look to be 100. And it's, uh, Ikaria, the, uh, the Greek island I go, is one of five blue zones. And a lot, a lot can be gleaned from the way the people live there. Anyway, I'm going to be doing a camp uh, early June. Okay. One this past year around August. And I think I'm going to go just a little ahead of the tourist season. It gets pretty crazy in the Greek islands, you know. Um, I'll have some other things coming up I'll announce. But they can go to stmaxwellsc.com. There's contact information if people want to shoot me an email. Uh, inquiries, questions uh, about uh, training with me, uh, you know, products that I have, things like that. They can catch me there. Well, Steve, thank you so much. I, I, I was so kind of you to come on before Thanksgiving. And like I said, you're such a positive person and you, you just motivate so many people to live a better, healthy life. And you're just, a, you're just a really good person. And I just want to tell you, thank you so much for coming on again and um, I just have such high regard for you. I, I owe you a, I owe you a nice meal when you come to come out here to Cali. But uh, thank you so much for being on. I'm very appreciative. I appreciate it, Martin. And uh, have a, have a great holidays. We're coming into. It's going to happen real quick. Before you blink, it's going to be Christmas. Yes, and it will be. It'll be 2023 20, before we know it. <laughs> yes, and, and like I said, I like I said, if you ever come out here, you just know I, I owe you a nice, healthy meal. I'd love to have that with you. Uh, that, that's the only kind I eat, healthy meal. <laughs> exactly. Well, have a great have a great holiday, and we'll be talking soon. And thank you, thanks again, Steve, for everything. Bye bye. Now, have a good take, one. Take care, my friend. Bye bye.